poem for my sister and a poem for all women. As children, we would dance together, playing outside with the Carolina sun beaming upon us, but we didn't mind as long as we had each other. Our laughter would fill the air thick and heavy like the Curtis processing plant smell that stung the inside of our nose. Each and every day was like a lesson that we learned with no remorse. And like all things, we had secrets, of course. You would share your dolls with me with no fear of punishment because you knew before I did that our hearts and minds were the same, that only our bodies were different. A poem for all women. Society teaches girls to be silent, to not compete, to be compliant, to be patient and sweet, that the bodies of women are only intended for the pleasure of men or as vessels for children. When women resist these expectations, it is regarded as revolutionary, a problem that needs to be solved by any means necessary. No one should expect women to make amends for their excellence. Each day of our lives is like a highlight reel filled with dramatic instances. And the world is like the audience watching every move and every moment, personally witnessing our every trial, triumph, and success substantiated and validated unquestionable braveness as a god is endowed with the power of infinite patience you have been tolerantly waiting for the mankind to allow you to use your greatness the world doesn't deserve you yet you are the world stand up and be proud because you are woman not the second sex nor the second best. You are just as capable, undeniably irreplaceable, unerasable, like an eclipse of the sun, falling stars and rainbows across the sky, ethereal magnificence. You are the sublime kind, mother, sister, daughter. You are holy, wholesome, wholeness, like the Trinity. All identities of you are marvelous. Whatever you dream, you can manifest from thin air. It's no magic trick, but black girl magic does exist. Wow, that was such a powerful piece. Hey everybody, it's me, your host, Ken Like Barbie. I'm back. Did you miss me? I'm sorry, y'all. I'm not gonna be around for long for this one because we have some phenomenal women joining us for this next plenary. And I wanna get out of their way so they can dive right into the conversation about women's health and their HIV prevention treatment options. For far too many years, HIV research and treatment has focused on men. So many men, marginalized men, disenfranchised men, urban men, all types of men. But you know, we haven't forgotten our sisters who survived in the struggle with us. And so today, we're gonna to talk about where clinical trials, the research, and the commitments to women's HIV health has gotten us. Because in some ways, we've made strides. But in a lot of ways, there's still ways to go. Here to guide the discussion is Danielle Campbell, a renowned sexual health research advocate from Los Angeles. Danielle will be speaking to women representing a range of perspectives. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of your hair and the stage belongs to you. Take it away. Thanks so much, Ken, and welcome everybody to our plenary discussion, our Pink Table Talk. We're here to join you all to talk about women's engagement and inclusion with biomedical prevention research. My name is Danielle Campbell, and I have a, a spectacular lineup of individuals here with me today. Who can you take a moment to introduce themselves? Hi, my name is Mobley Das, and I am um, an infectious disease and public health person, and, um, and I work at Gilead Sciences. And I wanna thank Danielle for the opportunity to participate this conference and this topic really feels like home to me. And I just wanna say my commitment to fe feminism is inextricably linked to my interest in medicine and scientific innovation. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for including me. Thanks so much, Mopoli. Kim? Hello, I'm Kimberly Smith, and I am uh, an infectious disease physician and uh, head of research and development for Vive Healthcare. Uh, prior to Joining Vive Healthcare was an HIV treater and researcher in Chicago. Uh, now I'm based out of North Carolina, and um, I'm excited to be a part of this panel. This is this is a you know a HIV prevention is a passion project for me, and um, great to be able to be with this great panel of folks. And uh, so thank you, Danielle, for the invitation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. 
Marissa. Hi, Marissa. Um, just excited to put my input a little bit. So I have to share. <laughs> Welcome, friend. And last but most certainly not least, Dr. Celeste. Hello, thank you so much, Danielle, for leading this conversation. I am Celeste Watkins Hayes. I am a professor of sociology and public policy at the University of Michigan. And I am also author of the book, Remaking a Life, How Women Living with HIV Confront Inequality. And so honored to be with you today. Awesome, thank you all so much for taking the time again and, and welcome to our fabulous talk. Uh, so we're here to talk about women, cisgender women in particular, and access to biomedical HIV prevention strategies, in particular PrEP for oral PrEP. So there's been a lot going on in the world about uh, cisgender women's exclusion or limit, limitation of choice around PrEP. And so that's what we're gonna discuss. And I'm hoping that each of you can offer your, your sentiments about a couple of topics associated here. Um, I just have a few questions perhaps to help us start out our discussion. So for all the panelists and feel free to respond in no particular order, um, cisgender women's options for HIV prevention remain limited and participation in uh, prevention research trials face challenges. Can you speak to some of these barriers based upon your personal and professional experiences? I'm happy to start. Um, you know, so I agree with everything you said that it has been a challenge and, and some of the challenge has been that, um, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't necessarily always been the highest priority in the research field, in the prep field. And so, you know, we, it's up to us, I think, to change that. And, and I, you know, so I think, I think that there's been progress actually recently, obviously with the data that, that um, the HPTN 084 study showed, looking at, you know, a large study of, of uh, cisgender women in mostly in basically sub, sub-Saharan Africa that compared long acting prep to oral uh, standard of care prep. That study was super important because, you know, while there have been PrEP studies of women in the past, you know, we, we just hadn't gotten consistent data showing us the, the potential for PrEP in cisgender women. And so this study, I think, really came at the right time in being able to show us, you know, that, that, that we can find options that can be effective for women. And you know, it's I think it's it's moving the field forward and it's it's raising the bar for what the expectation should be for, you know, for designing trials uh, for prep and Amen. for really just you know getting it out there and, and and setting the bar high. Really quick, Dr. Ken, before another panelist chimes in, you said a couple of things that I think are important that we unpack. When you say long acting prep, can you give us a little bit? Just give us a little bit more about what you mean when you say that. What is long-acting PrEP? So long-acting uh, PrEP, um, so there is an experimental medication that, uh, that my company is developing called Cabotegravir. And uh, it is dosed as an injectable, a shot, an intramuscular shot, so a shot in your bottom, uh, every two months. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, and, and every, and uh, so that 084 study uh, was a study comparing that shot in your bottom every two months to taking a pill every day. The tough part about the study, and that's some of the tough part about research generally, was that it was what's called a double blind, double dummy study, which means that everybody in the trial got a shot in their bottom every two months. Half of those shots were placebo and half of them were real and everybody took a pill every day. Half of the you know, pills were real and half of them were placebo. So that means everybody in the study was getting PrEP, but they didn't know if the active PrEP they were getting was the pill they were taking or the shot they were getting. And mm -hmm. you know, that means it was just tough for people, right? Uh, they had to do everything uh, in order to, to get the, to get the benefit. But, you know, that's, that's some of the high bar that gets set a lot of times for developing drugs. I think the good news is that it gave us the answer we needed, uh, as far as understanding, you know, how effective could these, um, options be. 
But yeah, so that's that's the long acting prep in a nutshell. Awesome, thank you. Mopoli, what say you? So I think um, you asked about barriers for women participating in clinical trials. And if we look back through the history of both HIV treatment and HIV prevention for trials that did include women, um, I think some of the barriers include like how we design the trials. Dr. Smith just mentioned the high barrier. And if you think about our classic trials, they're like four or five hours in clinic and you're kind of waiting around, you do some questionnaires, you see the doctor or the study staff, and then you get your blood drawn and you do a bunch of other activities. And not all the, not all people have that amount of time that they can be off of work or whatever, or taking care of their kids or whatever they're doing to come into clinic for five hours and just do the study visit. Um, so I think some of the barriers for inclusion for women include making sure that we can support women in transportation, in childcare, and be more person-centered in our trial design, add awesome. flexibility so people can maybe do the questionnaires at home online and not have to come in to clinic for that whole chunk of time. And we found that a lot of these were very helpful in our WAVE studies that we did that were specifically for women and also included investigators and sites that had expertise and cultural competency at working with women and particularly black women in the United States as well as sites in Uganda and Russia that worked with um, you know, their local populations of women. So I think when you can do those things and make it more women-centric, person-centric, it can lower the, the threshold for participation and help include more women in clinical trials. Awesome, thank you for that. Marissa, what are your thoughts? Um. I'm still a little slow to all this, but um, I uh, I don't know. It sounds like there's a lot of a lot more like moving forward. There's a lot more um, to come in like a positive way, though. I think that's awesome. You guys are like doing so much. Um, I'm obviously on the other end of that, but <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. And I think, and I think that's awesome that more. she's saying. Um, mm -hmm. That you, you know, they're gonna figure out ways to do it online and stuff like that. That'll help, especially with people that have a lot of kids or a kid or, a, or an elderly family member that they can't leave the house, you know, they can't leave them unattended, stuff like that. I think that's awesome. Like, I, I'm excited. I'm really excited. I, I'm still on the good end of it. So <laughs> I'm really excited about it. Okay. You said, obviously, tell us a little bit more about what you mean, obviously. What's your relationship to this conversation? How do you fit within this within this whole thing? Well, me, myself, I, um, not obviously, uh, my situation is a little different than most people. I'm mm -hmm. homeless, I'm in the shelters. So, um, but I do have kids. And eventually when I get them, you know, I would definitely want certain things to be a little more, easier for me as a parent, not just that, I have an, a mom who is a double amputee. So she kind of needs like consistent help. You get what I'm saying? So these type I of do. things that are so easily accessible, if I could do it online or through mail, that would help me a lot more than if for me to leave and go to a doctor for several hours a day. You get what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So I do. Um, I think, I, I just think it's, I'm glad it's progressing the way it's progressing. Indeed, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Dr. Watkins Hayes, bring it in. What do you think? Well, well, the thing that's striking me listening to this conversation is what happens when women are in the room? What happens when scientists of color are in the room? What happens when people of a variety of different backgrounds and world experiences are in the room for these critical conversations, for setting up the trials, for designing the science, for implementing the science. Because what we're hearing is every step of the way, questions being asked about whether our scientific goals are amenable to the realities of people's lives. And when you have different perspectives in the room, people can insert questions and comments and make interventions that might be 
taken for granted by some that might go silent by others. So what I'm what I'm hearing and what I also want us to celebrate as we look at these, you know, two amazing scientists who are talking about this, about our work, I think just as we've made progress that's so noteworthy in how we do clinical trials, I think it's also important to note the progress we've made and who gets to make the decisions and who's part of the conversation and who gets to raise the questions. Um, and I wanna see more of that. And I want us to use this as an example of what diversity and equity and inclusion looks like. Yes. Terms, not just in terms of, um, who we're recruiting into the war, into the studies, but also who's actually conducting them. So I, the first thing I want to say is just is just mark this and celebrate this. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Hay- um, Celeste. I'm gonna just say Celeste. Fine, cool. <laughs> Call me Celeste. Thank you so much, Dr. Celeste. Um, I think you hit on some great points. Something that I heard you say is engagement, right? And we're talking about top-down engagement from who, you know, who the individuals are conducting the studies down to which individuals are recruited to participate. So to that end, I'd like to hear a little bit more from Dr. Kim and Dr. Mopoli about what strategies or what, you know, um, yeah, basically what strategies your organizations or your companies are using to continue to engage, you know, a, a multi- representation of women? Well, um, I'll start by saying first, the commitment has to be there. Um, I, you have yes. to, you know, you, you have to make the decision to consciously do it um, because it doesn't happen in a passive way. Um, that's true whether or not you're recruiting a, a, a trial that's looking at PrEP agents or you're recruiting a trial that is looking at treatment. Uh, it, if you don't make the commitment up front about how you're going to prioritize enrolling a diverse population, women, people of color, you know, LGBT across this, if you, if you don't make that commitment up front, you can't, you know, question it on the back end. So uh, it's about planning that from the beginning. And so, you know, I would just say as an example in our, you know, in, in our treatment trials, We have gotten to the point where now we will make a demand that folks can't enroll, you know, a man until they enroll a woman, for example, that you you make those rules so that it's not that you accidentally enroll a good population of women is that you enroll a great population of women by design. And so it's really making that commitment. And Celeste is 100 percent right it does make a difference who's in the room when you make the decision around how you're going to make the studies happen and who you're going to reach out to, who's going to be the leaders, where are the sites, who are the investigators at the sites? And, you know, are those sites doing all the things that Mopoli talked about, which is make sure childcare is available, make them in places where people can get access to them, find sites that actually know how to bring people in and support them in the way that they need to be. I'll stop there. Awesome points. I, I couldn't have scripted a better response, Dr. Kim. <laughs> Mopoli, your yeah, thoughts. I, I agree with everything Kim said. Um, I think, you know, we're in the process of planning our new long acting trial, which is with lenacapavir, and that's a drug that you can give in your um, in your tummy, like insulin. It's a subcutaneous uh, drug um, and it lasts for six months. So it's another kind of long acting drug that you can get twice a year. And we'll be studying that in in a diverse group of populations, one trial with women in South Africa and Uganda, and another trial with cisgender men, transgender women, transgender men, and gender non-binary individuals who have sex with men um, in the US, Latin America, and South Africa. Um, And I think, um, you know, I, I really appreciate what Les says, and it, I think it does change who's in the room when it happens, like who's talking and who's who's the decider. Um, and I think the other thing is, as we plan these trials, I'm thinking recritically and like critically and doing a reset on who we work with, where we work, 
to make sure that who we enroll is the right population. So classically, HIV trials have been in sort of the coastal cities and the in, in Chicago, and um, and that's where the epidemic may have been in the past, but it's not where the epidemic is now. So mm -hmm. we're trying to build research infrastructure in the southeastern part of the United States yes. and take research out of the academy and into the community. So we're working with community based research sites, sometimes run by nurse practitioners and nurses and not, um, you know, you know, academic investigators, obviously with support and direction from um, appropriately qualified personnel. We're working yes. with QHCs to, re you know, build research infrastructure at federally qualified healthcare centers, because that's where the people that we want in our studies go. And we're also asking some of our seasoned investigators to think about junior folks, think about people on their teams to bring up and support. So the people doing the trials, not just in the companies running the trials, but at the sites look like and are representative of, reflective of the people that we want to recruit into our studies. And we're also trying to, we're doing exactly what Kim said. We want to make sure we have, you know, whether we call them key performance indicators or goals, we're setting specific numbers that are specific to every site on um, what proportion people of color, what proportion Latinx, what proportion yes. specifically black, <laughs> what proportion, what proportion transgender to make sure we get the right numbers in this study because we know it takes the right intent and thought to get that diverse inclusive population and you know I'm from public health world and I know what gets measured gets managed so I'm setting those goals for each site um, you know in conversation with the investigators everybody has to agree but each site has their own numbers that they're going to have to bring in to make sure we have the right people. And I think that that's really important to be really humble and recognize the lived experience of the people we're working with and the site staff yes. and the recruitment staff and make sure that we have the voice of the person who's gonna use our drugs helping us co-create our work. So we've been working really closely on that. Awesome, thank you. Thank you both so much for your very insightful responses. They're very thoughtful. Um, I've had several very pointed discussions with the both of you about how you plan to engage community, how you plan to engage folks on the ground that are doing this work. Um, we're about halfway through our discussion. We're gonna take a quick break, pause the excitement, and then we'll come right back and talk more about women, prevention and treatment. Be right back, y'all. Welcome back, everybody. I'm here with my illustrious panel, Dr. Kim Smith, Dr. Mopoli Doss, Dr. Celeste Watkin Hayes, and the good, my good girlfriend, Ms. Marissa Mercado. Uh, we're continuing on with our discussion on cisgender women and biomedical HIV prevention. Uh, we heard from everyone on the state of the state, and we'll pick up our discussion. I did have a quick question for Marissa. Marissa, Marissa, Marissa. We've I'm talked here. this entire time about cisgender women on PrEP. I think it's high time that we bring you in the space and amplify your voice as a cisgender woman on PrEP, okay? Tell us what does taking PrEP mean to you and what's, you know, what's your experience been like taking PrEP and how you fit within the context of this conversation? What's the tea? Um, for me, I feel like it's a good opportunity to prevent and change my life for myself, not just mm -hmm. for myself, but for those around me, my family, and in general, just being safe in one way, considering I wasn't being safe in any other way before, you know? Um, I feel like it's, this is something that was a long time coming. For years, you hear about all these different races, all these different genders, every, just everything, like everyone was catching it. Everybody was getting HIV, everybody, you know, whatever, but they never had anything to like prevent you from getting that or to mm -hmm. even really take care of you. People are dying. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's great that there's this new study and there's like these things you can do, everything from the shots to the pills. And I think that's awesome. Like for me, I, the way I feel on prep, 
I feel like I'm taking a little, a few steps forward to prevent myself from ever having a situation that could be more dire than what my situation is now. And I think that's at least me being smart enough to think before I act. And, you know, sometimes we don't think. And it is what it is. But personally, I feel like this is really like a great, great thing to happen. I feel good about it. Like, I feel good on it. I, I'm happy. Like, I, I really enjoy this. Thank you, friend. So happy to hear you say that having options really is what it's about for you, right? And so just following up on that spirit, I'll ask, you know, the panelists, I'll start with you, Kim. What does it mean to you when you hear Marissa's sentiments, like limited options increases women's vulnerability to HIV? What does that mean to you when you hear it? So I was talking to mute and what else is new, right? Oh. Um, but uh, what I was saying when I was talking to mute was, I'm so happy to hear what Marissa was saying about feeling, yeah. essentially feeling empowered, feeling like you mm -hmm. have control, like you get to take, you know, you get to protect yourself. And that's, that's really what it's all about. I mean, we can talk about, while we can talk about different types of prep, the, the main point is that there are options for PrEP that allow women to make that choice to take care of themselves and prevent HIV. So, you know, we, we have for years talked about, you know, sort of a, a, a PrEP toolbox. And I think we are finally getting towards a direction of maybe getting there where it's, you know, it's options that fit that person's life. I mean, Mopali and I work for you know, rival companies, but we are not rivals. We, we you know, I've, I've known Mopali mo long before either one of us worked for pharmaceutical companies. I'm so happy you her said heart that. And her commitment. Oh, yeah. To doing something, you know, for, for women. And so I'm glad that she's there because that means that things are going to get done in a way that is more, that is doing the right things and designing the trials and getting to the right questions. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just excited to actually see all the things we've hoped for actually starting to come to fruition. I couldn't agree more. I think this is our time. I think, you know, we've been blasting the horn. We've been kicking down your doors. We've been screaming, 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 include women, find better ways to include women. And this is it. Mobley, your thoughts. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Marissa for um, sharing your story and your personal experience. And I think it's great that oral prep is a good option for you and helps you feel like you're in control and controlling your life. Um, I think the when I when I think about options in prep, I always think about birth control. And I think about the daily pill, which was the first kind of birth control and how that worked for a lot of people, but it didn't work for everybody. And there were teens who were getting pregnant and people having trouble taking care of taking their pills every day. because you have to remember to do it. Um, and then in birth control, we got other things like Depo and Norplant. So injections and implants and IUDs uh, with or without hormones. And you could just set it and forget it and not have to worry about it. And that's why it's so exciting about Cavatagravir. That's the first example of something long acting. And then we're working on our own long acting version. Maybe that'll work. There's also a pill that could last for a month. That's another thing that a different company Merck is working on. And so it's super exciting to see that people are trying to fill that tool toolbox and give people a suite of options. So if, the pill is the right thing for your life because you want to get off it and maybe get pregnant later. Or in the case of HIV, you want to be able to switch up your status really quickly on what kind of prevention you're using. That's good. If you want to be protected for a long time and not worry about it, then long acting makes sense. There's also a ring now. So there's all these options. And it, it really is a very exciting time for cisgender women because there's now an option that's just for women. Um, and a while ago, I didn't think we were gonna have that. So it's really exciting. Um, and I'm just happy that we're able to contribute to it and make sure you know our perspectives as women from different backgrounds um, are, are heard um, and help shape what we're doing. Cause it's nice to be in a position of being able to shape things. 
after spending years training in school and learning all about this stuff to be in the decision-making sense. Like, you know about that, Danielle. It takes a oh, long time. <laughs> quite a bit happening. However, right, I think it's our duty from the community side to hold you all accountable. Hold your feet to the fire, right? Have a moral and ethical obligation to find, the, to find and develop the best strategies to include all women. So when we are in this space where cisgender women are continually excluded, we gotta, you know, we have to sit down and talk like good girlfriends to figure out the best way forward. But I did wanna uh, switch gears a bit and tap Dr. Celeste, right? Dr. Celeste, you've had so much experience. You talked, you mentioned at the top of the, the discussion, your book, could you tell us about some of the lessons from the HIV treatment space that we can um, use maybe as we cross pollinate here in the prevention space? Sure. So um, what I loved about hearing Marissa's story and Marissa, the way that you prioritized yourself and your own health in a world that challenges that constantly because mm -hmm. women are socialized that we're supposed to come last and our health is supposed to come last. So us flipping the script on that is an act of powerful resistance and I love it. And one of the things that I think is really important as we think about encouraging women to put themselves first and to put their health first is to think about what kind of structures can we build to support women around that, right? So one of the things that I think that we learn very effectively from the treatment world is the importance of a safety net. So the idea that when people are in crisis, oftentimes they are not prioritizing their own health. You've got to think about food, shelter, what's going on with my kids. Um, sometimes there's a crisis situation around traumas, intimate partner violence, people dealing with mental health issues, substance use issues, the list goes on and on. So what the treatment community figured out was that if they were going to build a culture of um, testing and adherence, it would have to build a safety net around people to make it possible for them to be able to do so. So making sure that we're thinking holistically about HIV treatment and continuing to think holistically about HIV treatment because... I think that that it's such an imp important model and other places are looking to the HIV world for that model. We talk about opioids and we talk about even COVID. People are yes. looking to the HIV world to see what the special sauce was and the special sauce was it. Un we understand that people live in a context and you've got to address the context and help people navigate the context in addition to talking to people about a very immediate health concern or practice that we want them to take up, whether it's treatment or whether it's prevention tools like, like PrEP. So um, I love the fact that as we think about the care continuum, um, people are adapting that to think about the PrEP continuum. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. the National AIDS Treatment Advocacy Project, who's thinking about awareness, willingness, access, uptake, adherence, because what they recognize is there's opportunities for slippage at every step of the way because of the context of people's lives, because of the challenges that they're facing. So I hope that we take away the idea that we've still got to have those conversations around safety nets. People aren't going to um, come in for their appointments. They're not going to be ready to engage the conversation about the excellent scientific news about PrEP if they're in crisis management mode. So making sure that um, we don't let that safety net piece fall by the wayside, um, despite the really excellent biomedical tools available. I think um, the other thing that we've learned from the treatment world is the importance, just as we've been talking about, of options. Um, because it's a question of logistics and it's also a question of privacy and protection. Mm -hmm. So the idea that someone can engage in prep that is once a month or every six months puts them in a position where other people don't have to have access to information about their, their health and lives. The challenge with the daily pill is that somebody can find it. Somebody can use it as an opportunity to ask questions. What are you yes. doing? And it, and it can create a context of increased risk for somebody 
um, who is with an intimate partner who wants to engage in, in, in difficult discussions around, well, why do you need prep? What does that say about you? What does that say about me? What does that say mm-hmm. about us? Yes, that's um, or women who are operating in, con- in a variety of contexts where they have limited agency and limited voice. So what PrEP does is it protects their voice. This, this long acting PrEP, it protects their voice because having those minimal interactions, those one-on-one interactions with a healthcare provider creates a stronger context of privacy and therefore safety and protection. So, um, and those are the things that we learn from the treatment world as well, in terms of having to think about that in the context of us trying to get to U equals U and all of the things that challenge that and all of the areas of slippage along that treatment cascade. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we're taking some of the lessons um, and thinking about them in the context of PrEP. Awesome. So just two quick things, one of which is completely unscripted, Dr. Celeste. Chin, this public health message, you equals you, undetectable equals untransmittable. But I really wanted to take a minute. I don't think folks have the full thrust of who you are, right? So you wrote a book. Can you talk a little bit about this book? Like everybody didn't have the privilege to meet you on the side as you came down from delivering this phenomenal talk at a summit, right? And it meant the world to me, not only what you said, but how you said it. Tell them about, tell the world, tell the audience about this book. It is trans. Oh, thank you, Danielle. I really appreciate it. Um, Cause I, I worked hard on it. Thank you so, I'm sure so you much. Did. Thank you so, so much. And, and it, it meant the world to me to get the story right. Right. And to recognize that there are multiple stories in HIV, but I wanted it to ring true. So remaking a life is based on, work that I did over 10 years with women living with HIV in Chicago. And um, I interviewed women. I, um, when they allowed me and when it was appropriate, I went with them to doctor's appointments. So that's how I met Dr. Smith because of the number of women who said, I want you to meet my doctor. I want you to meet Dr. Smith. Um, who allowed me to go with them when they were doing activist events and speaking and telling their stories, who groups that allowed me to send in on their support group meetings um, and opened up the circle to me um, and women who were visiting social service agencies to get access to resources. So I was working with women for more than a decade, following them and, and hearing their stories. And what became really important to document was this trajectory that they described of dying from, to living with, to thriving despite HIV and moving along a trajectory where they believe that they have a death sentence when they are diagnosed to believing and behaving and understanding that HIV is in fact a manageable chronic illness. But the complexity is we know women are not just dying from HIV, they're dying from poverty and childhood yes. sexual trauma yes. and racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and all of those things that, that injure them on a day-to-day basis. So what I found was that in that dying from to living with to thriving despite process, part of what was holding women, part of what was helping them move along that trajectory was the HIV community. It was the safety net. It was the way in which it wasn't about just medical services. It was about providing people with social support. Come to a support group. Let's get you into case management. Let's get you a peer counselor. Let's have someone talk to you about your experiences, who's who's walking the same path and has walked the same path. It's about getting people access to economic assistance, to recognize that housing equals healthcare, that people need access to, to food pantries. People need access to disability insurance and other resources to help them survive. And then fourth, giving them an on-ramp to political and civic engagement, recognizing that you have a voice, that you have a story to tell, and that you can influence other people who are experiencing the same thing, but you can also influence policymakers. Exactly what you're talking about, Danielle, in terms of holding people's feet to to the fire who are in positions of power. The HIV community encourages that. It's part of the kind of baked in the cake development. And I trace the development of that. I trace the inclusion of women, cisgender and trans women in that. I trace the inclusion of people of color because what we also know is that while many, many people have been of diverse backgrounds have been grappling with HIV 
from the start of the epidemic, they haven't always been included in the HIV community. They haven't always been included in the story of HIV. So the book also traces how women began to organize, how people of color have been organizing to make sure that they have those seats at the table and in the conversation. So that's what the book is about. It's the story of the women in Chicago, but it's a national story about the building of the HIV safety net. Absolutely. And thank you so much for that quick and dirty about your book. And it's, you know, the prime reason why I hunted you to be a part of this discussion. There's so much translatability in the story between treatment and prevention. And prevention is in a space where we're now reclaiming that narrative to tell the story in the same way treatment did. Right? You have grassroots organizations that are fighting for positions of, quote, power and seats at the table to be able to fight and bring to bear some of the stories of the individuals whose lives they touch on a regular. But we haven't written our story just in the way the treatment side had. So it's important to have your voice to be able to contextualize and ground that, you know, just ground that piece. So thank you so much for taking the time to offer your voice and give us the way. With that said, I think we can uh, shift gears a bit. I'd just like, I'd like to ask each of you all um, for your remarks on what's our way forward, right? What do you offer women? What do we do next? We've you know, gone to our growing pains to talk about why women have been excluded. We've brought, into, you know, we brought to bear some great context from the treatment space. We know the formula. We know that women leading the charge to support other women is, the, you know, is what the way forward is, or at least I think, but you can correct me if I'm wrong there. So what do, you, what do each of you wanna offer women? What's your message? What do you leave with us before we close? I'll, I'll just say quickly that, um, you know, <clears throat> it, it, we've talked about hearing women's voices and that is so, so critical in in the, we talked about it in the context of treatment, it's gonna be critically important in the context of PrEP and, and actually fighting for access because what is the use of a toolbox that's locked, right? I mean, you know, that folks can't get at. And so, you know, as we develop, you know, great uh, biomedical interventions for PrEP, we have to be fighting for that access. And so, you know, Celeste talked about, you know, making sure that there's this safety net around, but it's, it's, it's making sure it, women needed to have access to care. They needed to have access to, to doctors, create those relationships, and then be able to be supported to be able to get on the treatment. We still have a ways to go there. We've made some progress, but when we get into this prep space, the reality is that what we know right now is that prep is available but women are not getting access to it in the nope. way that we want, we really need them to. They're not even getting offered uh, PrEP. They're not, no one, you know, docs aren't talking to them. Providers aren't talking to them. They're not in the spaces where people even know about it. You know, judgments are made about who should and shouldn't be offered PrEP. And so there's a whole lot more conversation that needs to, to be had. And, and I mm -hmm. think, Marissa, it would be great to hear your comments on this. But, you know, that's that's a big part of the problem. I bet you've got girlfriends who nobody ever even raised the possibility to them. Oh, yes. And so we got to get we have to go there because it being available means nothing if it's not being put in front of the people who might benefit from it. Right. I definitely, honestly, I could tell you, um, I was actually aware of PrEP uh, through another situation. I was uh, through talking to someone about HIV prevention, HIV and prevention. Um, once I was talking to them, they actually told me about uh, trying to go to the doctor, you know, check on yourself, make sure you're HIV negative, you know, make sure you're good, you know. And then when they explained everything to me, I was like, you guys have a treatment program? Like you guys have stuff going on already? Like, I'm like, this is cool. Like, it's really like, it really made me feel a lot better because the way, I, like I said, um, the way I used to live my life, I was very promiscuous. So um, having that now is even better because obviously that's not me anymore, but um, it was, but there's other people out there that are very friendly with themselves and 
this will definitely be a, a benefit for them in the long run because I mean to prevent it yourself from getting it. I've told my daughter about it. Like my daughter's 17. Mm. I told her about it and we had a little What's discussion. She was kind of <laughs> she was kind of like, Mom, you got the you got HIV? I'm like, no, you have to be HIV negative <laughs> to take the pill and it's to prevent it from happening if it mm -hmm. was to happen. You mm -hmm. know, and I told her it's it's better. You know, I explained it a lot of it to her. I told her it's a good prevention program. It's just uh, it's like condoms. It's supposed to protect you, you know. And I said, but the only thing is, you take it every day, you know. And she's like, well, that's weird. She's like, you know, I don't do, be doing nothing. I said, yeah, but you will. So how do you know? Why not? Why not just take it and prevent you, prevent the situation from happening before it happens? And she mm -hmm. is old enough to understand. And I know people want to pretend that their 17 year old is insane. I know I wasn't. So. I mean, I'm not even gonna sit here and lie and be like, oh, boys, no. Yeah, right. Um, my daughter is her mother's child. So, okay. and, you know what I'm saying? So I know, okay. I know she's never lied to me. She didn't have to lie to me about boys and things she was doing. So I'm definitely proud of her um, for kind of like saying, well, I might want to try that, but I want to wait a while because she's not doing anything right now. So she's kind of like, I want to wait a while. But I told her, let me know so I can let the next person know. So, but she did, she, we did have a good discussion about it. So she was excited, yeah. like that I was doing something to prevent, you know, and save myself or help myself. I know. I think that intergenerational dialogue is great, right? It's about empowerment, and regardless of age, it's about circumstance. If you feel like prep is an option for you, there should be a system in place, a safety net to help you access it without judgment and hopefully without cost. But, you know, we'll save that discussion for another day. <laughs> um, Mopley, your thoughts? What's the message for women moving forward? Well, I think like my biggest focus moving forward is to make sure that innovation doesn't exacerbate the, all, the existing disparities that we already have. And that when we make these new options, yeah. that there is access, especially for women and women of color and black women in the United States. That is one of our biggest priorities because we saw with COVID-19, infections track along the fault lines of social inequality and COVID-19 hit certain people harder than it hit others. And just like HIV did, and then you get innovations in COVID-19, like the new drugs and the vaccines and the treatments. And we just need to make sure everyone can benefit and choose the right option for their life and their stage of life. So that is what I think we all should be focusing on. And I know everybody here is focusing on it. So together we can move forward. Awesome, thank you, Mobley. Dr. Celeste. I would just echo everything that, that's been said. Um, I'm concerned about the awareness question as well. I'm, I'm still experiencing too many women who've never heard of PrEP. Um, and we have a long way to go to, to address that disparity. Um, and the other thing that I would say is this is absolutely a, a health equity issue. So as health equity concerns are getting increased attention um, in the wake of, of COVID-19, we have to be ready to talk about um, health equity um, within HIV as well. And, and the final thing I'll say is to the, to the folks out there who, think, who are activists or thinking about activists, the activism, you know, please have a voice, please continue to have a voice because that's how the needle hit is getting moved. It truly is. And um, we, we have the evidence um, to bear that out is to bear that point out as well. What the, the progress that we've made is, is absolutely due to these amazing scientists. And it happens in partnership with the community um, help, helping to set the agenda and helping to, to offer the voice. So, so that partnership has to be um, present. So I encourage people to continue speaking up and, um, and developing their voice and getting out there and, and talking about what the needs are. So, and I'm just honored to be part of this group and just, and just so proud to, to see how in, increasingly involved women are in these conversations around um, research. Thank you. And my, again, I'd like to offer my sincerest thanks to each and every one of you for indulging me in this conversation and this journey to get here. Um, I couldn't have asked for a more fruitful conversation. I mean it. Thank you. 
Um, we'll close out here, but as we do, I wanted to offer those, offer um, um, an online Facebook group um, for those who are interested. We are mobilizing on the ground. There's a consortium of, of black folks from around the globe. Check us out on uh, Facebook, Prep in Black, Prep in B-L-A-C-K. If you are of the diaspora, we welcome you to join us in our global fight to bring this conversation locally um, and to just unite, to be able to transform what this discussion looks like from us, for us, by us. So with that said, I will take a stop there. Thank, thank you. you, Danielle. No, let, let us take a moment and thank you yeah. Yeah. for raising thank your voice you. and for getting us together and always challenging. So thank you, Danielle. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for including us and for your leadership, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>